Over the last two weeks, we've looked at two ways the war in Ukraine has evolved over the winter. We looked both at the economic side of the conflict and the energy war, then we looked at the military side of the Russian winter offensive and its market failure to make much of anything in the way of territorial gains. But there's a third aspect that I think needs to be covered to round out this winter update, and that's the question of attrition and the state of the respective forces. Because holding or taking territory isn't the only thing that matters, because it's the cost of doing so in lives and materiel that can ultimately prove far more decisive than any given piece of terrain. In broad terms, we know the cost of Russia's winter offensive has been high. The evidence has been there in images and video, often in full HD. But trying to estimate attrition and the ability of both sides to deal with it is a difficult prospect. And yet, I think it's an exercise worth doing. Because as much as it can sometimes feel like the resources available to an army are infinite, they simply aren't. And the way this war evolves over the spring and summer will have a lot to do not just with the losses that the armies have suffered over winter, but how well they're able to come back from them. So what am I going to be doing? Well, first I'm going to give a little bit of historical context, looking at attrition and casualty rates through history, and trying to couch what we're seeing in Ukraine today against some historical context. Then I'm going to look at casualty estimates, both for the war in general and also for the winter specifically. Given the amount of propaganda out there about casualty figures, a lot of that discussion is going to be about methodology. Not just looking at the various estimates out there, but also how best to use them in an environment where information availability is limited. Then we're going to look at how both sides have tried to deal with those casualties, be it through mobilisation, the conscription of prisoners, or the placing of recruitment advertisements on Pornhub. We'll try to assess how well both armies are coping with losses in personnel, and then pivot to the question of equipment instead, because force quality is about more than just the people you have. It's about the tools they have to fight with, and nothing drives equipment consumption quite like a major offensive. We'll close out by asking the question of how well both armies are dealing with these challenges, and whether they're on their last legs or have a lot of fight left to give. Okay, so as promised, let's start with a little bit of historical perspective. Because as much as technology or tactics have changed over time, there is one aspect in which war never changes, and that is that it has always driven casualties amongst those involved. But the casualty rates of individual battles or conflicts have changed dramatically over the course of history with figures varying wildly based on the technological, social, or geopolitical context in which that warfare takes place. Throughout history, for example, you can find societies that seem to have decided that they wanted the ability to wage war against their neighbours, but didn't want to have a particularly high chance of, you know, dying in that warfare. Obviously, there are extreme examples, like conflicts being decided by a battle between two individual champions. I don't expect for this war to be resolved with a Putin v Zelensky 1v1, but the historical precedent is there. But humanity has also seen entire styles of warfare evolve to be fought in ways that mitigate casualties. Ancient Greek hoplite warfare, for example, wasn't particularly lethal. Most hoplite armies were essentially militia raised from the farming class. They used heavy bronze armour, massive hoplon shields, relatively short spears, and deep formations of heavy infantry. That's a combination that puts a lot of focus on defence and not very much on offence meaning that even in a decisive battle, most people involved got to go home. At the Battle of Delium, for example, between the Boeotians and the Athenians, the attacking side lost about 2.7% of its force, KIA, against 10% of the defender. Even more important for keeping casualties down was the fact that wars were often considered over after one or two decisive battles. The Greeks of the polis wanted to be able to strap on their armour for a couple of weeks, go have a fight and have the issue decided so they could get back to farming. But those sort of systems often require a degree of either cooperation between both sides or a specific confluence of tactics and technology. Where one or the other suddenly evolves throughout history, you often see spikes in casualty rates. If someone invents the machine gun, but generals continue to make frontal infantry attacks against entrenched positions, well then casualties are going to dramatically increase until someone comes up with tactics or technology to deal with the new threat. Another thing that's changed over time is the balance between combat-related and non-combat-related losses. For much of human history, you were far more likely as a soldier to be killed by disease or the climate than you were by enemy action. In certain climatic zones, the mosquitoes have fought their war against humanity for millennia, with humans barely firing a shot in response. In modern conflicts between industrial powers, this is no longer the case. Soldiers are less likely to get sick, and if they get sick, it's much more likely that militaries will be able to treat them. And so you see figures like 80% nearly of US combat deaths in Afghanistan being a result of enemy action, 
So there's much less chance in modern war of being taken out by something like dysentery before you two get your chance to be properly shot at. While the ratio between those wounded and killed has shifted dramatically in favour of the wounded. All else being equal, being shot in the 21st century is just much less lethal than being shot during the Napoleonic Wars. But the key warning here is that those numbers aren't magical, they exist because training, technology and practices are in place. But the industrialization of warfare, even as it made medical care easier, increased dramatically the total casualties you could expect to flow from a conflict. The reasons for that were reasonably simple. Industrial societies were capable of supporting much larger populations on any given unit of territory. And they often had the financial, industrial and agricultural resources to mobilize a greater share of their population and keep them in the field for longer periods of time. The hoplites of ancient Greece were farmers, they had to go back to their fields or everyone was going to starve. But by World War II you've got countries like Britain that were capable of mobilising more than 20% of their population into direct military service, supplying them with arms and equipment and then keeping them at war for multiple years. And then winning a conflict becomes a matter of either obtaining such a decisive military advantage over the opponent that they surrender or you're able to fully overrun them, or spending the time necessary to completely run an industrial state out of the resources it needs to be able to resist. A process which could take years, stress national resources, and demand the mass mobilisation of the national population. That's part of the reason that World War I and World War II were able to go on for as long as they did, because the states involved had the capacity, had the resources to carry on even after losing hundreds or thousands, millions or tens of millions of people. And if you tried to half-ass the struggle, then you took the risk of defeat, occupation and potential national annihilation. Now in that respect it's often been said that the war in Ukraine is sort of a return to 20th century warfare. And in a sense that's true. Post the collapse of the Soviet Union, many Western militaries re-geared themselves. They downsized tremendously. They gave up or reduced their reserve components and they reconfigured themselves at a lower budgetary level for things like peacekeeping, stability operations, counterinsurgency or expeditionary warfare. Not so much for forming a long front line against a peer adversary and then slugging it out. Having a force structure that wasn't particularly well designed to handle mass casualty events didn't really matter if you were primarily fighting the sort of wars where casualties stayed low. The Taliban packed considerably less firepower than the Russian army. But in Ukraine, we're back to solid front lines, artillery duels, and battles between peer opponents. But as much as this is disruptive and incredibly damaging for all those involved, for the sake of perspective I feel it's important to point out that it hasn't quite yet captured the scale of some of those conflicts. UN forces in Korea, for example, during 1953 fired considerably more rounds of artillery ammunition than the Russians did during 2022. And mobilization rates are similarly not quite at historical highs. But that's probably little comfort to the families of those who have been killed or wounded in the fighting in Ukraine so far, be it in 2014 or in the latest winter campaign. As an external observer, assessing casualties is an incredibly difficult task. They're much harder to measure from open sources than things like vehicle losses, which tend to leave more in the way of evidence, things like vehicle wrecks. They're also likely to be kept closely secret by both sides because of how politically sensitive the loss of troops is. Especially at times when the front line isn't moving, the attention often turns towards the relative balance of attrition. And so there's huge incentives on both sides and their supporters to amplify the projected number of enemy casualties while minimizing those their own force has suffered. Secrecy and uncertainty creates an information gap. And whenever there is an information gap, there will be those trying to fill it, whether using legitimate methods of approximation or otherwise. And the internet being what it is, there is an awful lot of otherwise out there. And so I thought I'd open by looking at some of the estimates I've seen used around the internet in order to approximate casualties, and why I think they might be more than a little problematic. I'll start with techniques that are based on counting something else. For pro-Russian estimates, this is often counting artillery shells, and for pro-Ukrainian estimates, this is often counting vehicles visually confirmed lost. The artillery argument goes something like this. A majority of casualties caused in this war are by artillery. Russia fires more artillery, therefore Russia is causing a larger number of casualties. This doesn't work because not all artillery fire is equal. Fires are called in for different purposes against different targets. Harassing or suppressive fire is going to drive fewer casualties than dropping HE on concentrated infantry that are launching an assault across open ground. 
And then there are a half dozen other factors beside how entrenched is the target, the attacker is going to be in the open, the defender might be in a trench, and it's much harder to destroy a target that's entrenched rather than one that's in the open. What sort of weapon are they engaging with? Are they firing 155mm howitzers or are they firing 115mm tank rounds? How accurate are they? Is the fire drone corrected? What's the precision and skill of the artillery team? Even the season matters, as muddy or soft ground will reduce the impact of ground burst shells. In short, there are enough moving parts here that I don't think you can derive good estimates just from counting artillery rounds. Similarly, there are problems drawing estimates based on the number of destroyed vehicles. The way the Russians have used their vehicles has changed over time. The number of dismounts per vehicle has again varied over time. So just as with counting shells, I'd be pretty cautious counting vehicles destroyed to try and estimate human losses. Another one I see all the time is this magic 3 to 1 ratio. I'm sure you've seen this one in the comment sections or used on Twitter. Usually presented as the argument that the attacker always loses three times as many people or pieces of equipment as the defender. In reality, wearing a little badge saying defender doesn't make a fight a foregone conclusion. What the rule is actually meant to be is a rule of thumb to represent the general advantage the defender enjoys in certain military operations. And then in order to overcome the advantages the defender naturally enjoys, then an attacker is going to need to bring significantly more combat power in order to compensate. That ratio is an approximation, it's obviously not fixed, urban terrain can create a much greater advantage than open fields for example. And it's entirely possible to have situations where attackers inflict asymmetric casualties or where defenders inflict casualties far beyond just a 3 to 1 ratio. Another approach, which can be used dishonestly or honestly, is to inappropriately mix methods. For example, I might take the estimates from the Russian Ministry of Defense for the number of Ukrainian troops that are killed and then apply some sort of ratio to it to generate the number of wounded, maybe four or five times based on some sort of historical precedent, whatever example I want to use. The problem is those Russian estimates have already been generated using their own method and assumptions. A set of assumptions that decides how many Ukrainians that are made casualties are likely to be killed as opposed to wounded. And based on Sergei Shoigu's release in September of last year, they actually estimate, according to their method, more Ukrainians killed than Ukrainians wounded. Because apparently every Russian artillery shell is enchanted with a freaking Avada Kedavra spell, causing a kill to wounded ratio that looks like something out of ancient history. If you just ignore that and put a times five multiplier on top of it, then what you're effectively doing is cherry picking your way to a much higher estimate. Another thing to watch out for will be people applying different methods to estimate both sides' casualties. For example, if I was on the pro-Russian side, what I might do is estimate Russian casualties based on a count of confirmed Russian troop obituaries but then I can turn around and count Ukrainian casualties using some other method that is nowhere near as conservative. Say, for example, deriving it from artillery shells fired or taking the Russian MOD estimates as gospel. If someone's applying different rules to different sides, they should be very clear about why they're doing so. And then finally, you'll see people taking a bunch of garbage data, throwing it together and pretending that the result is a valid statistical study. Something that obviously no one would ever do in real world academia. For example, I saw a very popular post by someone who claims to have used an averaging method to calculate likely Ukrainian killed in action. And what they did was average three different estimates, you know, in order to find a reasonable middle point. Input number one was a fake CNN story, which I've featured before, one that was so bad that its content was even mocked by Wagner. Another was a bizarre fake news story that claimed to be estimates from Mossad which featured some absolute gems, by the way, including, again, as is traditional, the entire Ukrainian Air Force being shot down multiple times, thousands of active duty NATO troops having been killed in Ukraine, and Russian armoured vehicle losses that were a tiny fraction of those that are already visually confirmed. Finally, they added in the speech by Ursula von der Leyen, where she misspoke and said that 100,000 Ukrainian military personnel had been killed, as opposed to killed and wounded. Not the first time a politician has flubbed a statement, they retracted it and corrected it relatively quickly after the story broke, but the damage was already done. And what the user then did was stuck all of these together and presented it as a reasonable average. That has the veneer of statistical vigour, but the reality is, as in any analytical model, garbage data in is going to lead to garbage results out. So far as the estimates that are out there, they generally follow this sort of information divide model that I've talked about before. These are where the stories of Ukrainian superhumans gunning down 30 Russian for every one of their own that falls get started, while some of the most over-the-top pro-Russian estimates actually come from English-speaking pro-Russian commentators. 
who have no direct or indirect involvement in the war itself, but who may be deeply involved in the information campaign. And just to illustrate this point, let's look for a moment at the official Russian estimates. Now, we've already established why the official Russian estimates of Ukrainian losses are complete bullshit. The equipment figures are actually impossible. The system is set up to reward consistent overclaiming. And the historical precedent suggests that even if they clamped down on that false reporting culture, overclaiming would still likely take place. So keep that in mind as I give you the following numbers. In September, Sergei Shoigu said the Ukrainians had lost 61,000 killed in action and 49,000 wounded in action for a total of 105,000. In the months of January and February, Shoigu says they lost 19,000. He doesn't specify killed or wounded, but I'm going to assume he meant killed in action. He also suggested that the 11,000 in February was a particularly high number. Do some estimates around the intervening months and you end up at about 100,000 killed in action, 86,000 wounded in action, for a total of 193,000. That's an approximate, and it's according to the Russian Ministry of Defense. But it has nothing on some of the other, quote, estimates that are out there in the information space. If you listen to Scott Ritter back in November of 22, for example, you'd be told the number is closer to 250,000 KIA. We're then invited to extrapolate out roughly 600,000 wounded, which ends up leaving you with an estimate that the entire Ukrainian military, not just frontline combat personnel, but the entire Ukrainian mobilized force has been either killed or wounded by November last year, which obviously doesn't reconcile very well with the continued existence of a Ukrainian military. And with every week that passes, it seems that someone else pushes the boundaries with their claims. Recently, I found a video claiming 400,000 Ukrainian KIA. Personally, I'm not sure if these sort of figures should even be treated to the title of estimate. Estimates are meant to be based on something, and they're meant to be able to either explain reality or enable us to predict it. Whereas these sort of figures do allow you to make predictions, it's just predictions that never come true. As for a more serious answer to the question of how many troops have been lost on both sides, the answer I can give you is probably going to be unsatisfying. The war is a black box, this sort of information is closely guarded. And we can advance estimates, but the confidence level is going to be pretty low. For example, if you wanted to set up a bounded process, what you could do is take the ministry statements from both sides and assume that they're likely to be inflated and so make for good upper estimates. That would give a Russian estimate of roughly 107,000 Ukrainian KIA and a Ukrainian estimate of roughly 168,000 KIA Russians. Then we need to find a method that we think is going to be an undercount to serve as the floor. For the Ukrainians, that's a statement in December that the Ukrainian army had lost between 10 and 13,000 dead. And for pro-Russian casualties, we're going to look at the Mediazona method, which is counting obituaries. Mediazona scans social media, local media reports, and official statements to verify casualties in Ukraine. What they're usually counting are things like obituaries stating that someone died in Ukraine. So if there is no official announcement, they're not counted. If they're considered missing in action rather than KIA, then they're not counted. If there is an obituary, but it doesn't mention them being killed in Ukraine, not counted. Or if there is a social media post, but it isn't made by a relative, again, not counted. And then there are going to be the entries the team simply can't find. But because there's unlikely to be a death notice without someone actually, you know, dying, this figure serves reasonably well as a very conservative flaw. That method yields about 17,000 KIA Russians, including PMCs, and about 7,000 proxies. And what you end up with is a very wide range in which the estimate probably sits. Between 13,800 and 107,000 dead Ukrainian troops, and between 24,000 and 168,000 KIA on the pro-Russian side. Those are very wide ranges, but the more precise you try and get, the less confident you're going to be. If you want to see some of the estimates that are out there, I present some here. These are primarily from Western sources, but they're less aggressive than the Ukrainian estimates. And critically, some like the CSIS or Mediazona let you have a look at their methodology and understand their working. In January, the Norwegians estimated 180,000 pro-Russian casualties versus a bit over 100,000 for the Ukrainians. Come January, the Center for Strategic and International Studies was estimating between 200 and 250,000 Russian casualties. And you can see a number of other estimates on the screen there. My goal here is not to defend any individual estimate. It's to tackle those crazy ideas right out on the flanks, and then to get at least an approximate idea of the scale of the challenge both sides now face.
So if that's the picture for the conflict as a whole, where does it leave us in terms of assessing the impact of the winter campaign specifically? The first thing to say is that sources triangulate around it being a pretty bloody campaign. On the Ukrainian side, Ukrainian media have openly carried articles covering the extensive human cost of defending places like Bakhmut. While, for whatever it's worth, Sergei Shoigu and the Russian Ministry of Defense identified February as a particularly deadly month for the Ukrainian armed forces. And on the Russian side, a majority of the evidence all points in the same direction. Despite being engorged with tens of thousands of prisoners, you've got the leader of the Wagner Group talking about manpower depletion. Russian commentators like Strelkov openly talk about, quote, the extermination of our remaining assault infantry, end quote, over the course of the winter assaults. And both Western and Ukrainian estimates of Russian personnel losses have jumped considerably. If you look at those examples I put forward earlier, for example, in late January, the Norwegians were estimating 180,000 Russian casualties. A month later, the CSIS, taking a Delphi method approach, came up with a figure of between 200 and 250,000. But while those numbers might seem horrifying, they're not entirely out of step with the war so far. They represent significant escalations over the figures we were estimating in November or December. But it's a difference that would fall within a statistical margin of error, not an order of magnitude difference. From a personnel perspective, I think more than how many people have been lost, it really matters who has been lost. Most of the estimates we've looked at suggest that Russia and Ukraine haven't lost the overwhelming majority of the forces that they've raised but the people they have likely lost probably include some of their better combat operators. Militaries have both teeth and a tail. You've got personnel doing the fighting, but you've also got personnel at headquarters doing planning, intelligence, logistics, or support roles. And given the battlefield is usually more dangerous than HQ, losses tend to be weighted towards the teeth. To a great extent, this is now a war of mobilized personnel and reserve officers. Not just because pre-war professionals have been killed or wounded, but because the increase in the size of the military has had to be made up of mobilised personnel. We continue to talk about elite units, like the 155th Naval Infantry for Russia. But those units are now likely in a hybrid state. You'll still have some hardened survivors, pre-war professionals. And around them, you'll have mobilised personnel, who have considerably less experience and may not want to be there at all. That probably poses a real force quality challenge and means commands on both sides will probably have to grapple with the fact that many units may just not be as capable or as skilled as they once were. That likely leaves both armies facing three interrelated but still different manpower challenges coming out of the winter campaign. The first is a quantity problem. How quickly can they call up people to replace those that have been killed or wounded over the course of the winter fighting? The second is how well they can train them, how much can they do to maintain force quality. Because if you're a Russian army and keep refilling elite units with undertrained Mobix, then eventually the unit is going to be elite in name only. And then there's the final question of how long the countries can keep this process up. Based on their demography and political circumstances, how many individuals can feasibly be mobilised? And how long can this process of force regeneration be maintained? So with that said, let's have a look at how Ukraine and Russia have been responding to these sort of challenges. And we'll start with the Ukrainians who largely emerged from winter having succeeded in their defensive efforts, but who no doubt suffered losses under constant Russian pressure. And so for Ukraine, the primary challenge is to maintain the flow of replacements to units that are suffering casualties, while also preparing new units for potential offensive actions. Ukrainian mobilization is an interesting topic and not one I often see covered in detail. Ukrainian mobilization appears to be an ongoing process that takes place in waves. In theory, the fundamental structures are very similar to the Russian ones. Both are a legacy of some of the organization inherited from the Soviet Union. The Ministry of Defense will look at casualty estimates and also demands for new units and determine manpower requirements. Not just how many men need to be called up, but also what backgrounds, what skills, what characteristics are preferred. Notifications will then be handed out, conscripts will be directed to a training centre, and from a training centre to an operational deployment. It bears noting that the system clearly isn't perfect. The Soviet legacy runs deep. The system is vulnerable to things like mismanagement, or misalignment in incentives between officials trying to meet targets, and the processes the law says that they should be following. But in practice, it appears it's allowed the Ukrainians to do three things at once. On one hand, it's allowed for the enlargement of many existing Ukrainian brigades. Having returned from a study trip to Ukraine, Kaufman alludes to some Ukrainian brigades that now look more like divisions when you count the number of infantry battalions in their structure. 
That approach has the advantage of allowing you to increase overall manning levels while relying on the officers or the headquarters or the experienced troops that are already in place in an existing brigade structure. Secondly, the process has been used to reconstitute and maintain units, some of which have taken horrific casualties fighting at places like Bakhmut. And finally, there's the question of creating entirely new units. And it's that last element that's been particularly closely followed by foreign observers. Because even as Ukraine has fought the incredibly bloody battles around places like Bakhmut and Avdivka that we talked about before, Ukraine has also been heavily telegraphing potential counteroffensive action. And by this point, both Russian and Ukrainian sources broadly agree that Ukraine's been building up the resources to do exactly that. This process is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is because of the announcement of the so-called offensive guard. These aren't units of the Ukrainian army, they're organised by the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And basically what this represents is consolidating a whole bunch of Ministry of Internal Affairs and other units that have been fighting for a year, many of which have taken casualties, and augmenting them and rebuilding them for offensive action, with a notable distinction being that they are volunteer only. So you're talking about brigades that will combine existing veterans with new volunteers who know they are signing up for units explicitly intended for offensive action. That's a recruiting pitch that's going to appeal to a very specific class of individual, and I suspect that's the point. At the same time, the Ukrainian army has been creating or reconstituting brigades of its own. These are the formations that will be absorbing a lot of the newly arriving Western equipment. There are also formations that will benefit greatly from troops that have been trained in Western countries. I'd argue the fact that Ukraine's been able to create these units while fending off a Russian winter offensive is probably a victory for their fourth generation efforts. But at the same time, Western pledges fell short of what Ukraine had originally asked for. And time will tell if the resulting force is sufficient for the task over spring and summer. Despite the losses it suffered, Ukraine probably remains more constrained by the supply of heavy equipment, ammunition, and also its training pipeline than it does by the availability of recruits. Millions of potentially eligible Ukrainians have not yet been mobilized. And despite the losses over the winter, it appears that Ukraine is still capable of, in parallel, building up new formations. Then there's the question of how the Russian military has responded to the casualties that it has no doubt suffered over the winter campaign. And if Russia wants to keep up the pressure, then replacements are going to have to come from somewhere. Despite public commentary often charging that the Russian government doesn't care particularly much about the casualties it suffers, so far in this conflict we've often seen Russia take a procrastinating or conservative approach when it comes to mobilisation, preferring halfway measures to the real deal. For most of 2022, they tried to avoid calling up conscripts, instead conscripting heavily in the DNR and LNR using regional volunteer units from the various Russian republics, or by bringing in personnel from the Russian National Guard or famously from deploying PMCs, including Wagner Group. The issue with those methods is that they seldom solve the problem for long, which led to Russian active duty units being stretched and things like the Kharkiv counteroffensive becoming possible. It's difficult to understand exactly why the Russians have chosen this approach, but one working theory is that Putin has always been concerned about the political consequences of large-scale mobilisation of Russian conscripts. Partial mobilisation did solve the problem for a time. Some mobilised personnel were rushed to the front to fill out lines or refill units, others were put into their own units to bulk out the Russian military. But as we moved out of winter, many analysts expected Russia to announce a further mobilisation because by now the mobilised personnel have been carrying the brunt of casualties for the better part of six months. And despite taking heavy casualties, the Russians still talk about increasing the size of the military or raising new units. But despite days, weeks and months passing, no further announcement has been made. Instead, most of what we've seen so far is more fragmented halfway measures. The restriction on Wagner's ability to recruit from the Russian prison system was reportedly followed by the Russian military looking to do the same. Meanwhile, there's been a surge in recruitment efforts by the various PMCs, particularly Wagner. And yes, that did reportedly include putting up an advertisement on an adult website, with the pitch being, and I quote, We are the effing coolest private army in the world. I guess nothing says we are defending conservative Orthodox Christian values from the decadent West. Quite like that sort of recruiting effort. There's also some evidence to suggest Russia is employing other methods to solve manpower problems without resorting to further mobilisation including taking personnel with specialist military skills and using them to fill vacancies in the infantry assault units. There are videos by trained artillerymen, for example, saying that they are being sent into battle as assault infantry, 
There are Russian POWs who claim to just be ordinary sailors who are repurposed to naval infantry armoured units. And in one of the war's potentially stranger reverses, we also have situations where Russian mobilised personnel are reportedly being pushed forward in units, having their units disbanded in inverted commas, and then being merged into DNR or LNR formations. And there they're complaining that separatist commanders are using them as cannon fodder, which you'll recall is exactly what the Russian command was accused of doing using DNR and LNR units in 2022. It's unclear whether these sort of informal transfers of personnel are happening on a very limited and local scale or whether it's more systemic. For the troops involved, the consequences might be severe. Not only does your chance of dying significantly increase, which is a small problem for most people, it may also have an impact on the ability of an individual to draw combat pay, access services for veterans, or for someone's family to get death benefits in the event that they're lost in Ukraine. But from a harsh military utility perspective, the greater loss is probably deploying specialist personnel, like artillerymen, and getting them killed or wounded doing work they weren't trained for, like infantry assault duty. Now, human life is obviously human life, and the Russian forces clearly need more infantry. But ideally, you want to give specialists a chance to do their jobs. If Amazon started telling their cybersecurity team to drive delivery trucks, for example then I expect someone in upper management would rapidly find themselves being performance managed. And the recent announcement that the Russian military wants to expand by 400,000 personnel also strikes me as wishful thinking, namely because Russia wants 400,000 new full-time professional volunteer contract soldiers. Now, for context, that's about the number of full-time contractors the Russian military had before it invaded Ukraine and it was struggling to increase that number already. Now they're saying they want to increase that figure to 521,000 by the end of 2023 and 695,000 eventually. Three things stand out from those numbers. The first is that most of the projected increase isn't meant to happen until 2024 and beyond. The second is any recruitment campaign wouldn't have to just increase the numbers over what's currently there. It would also have to replace casualties. Although I suppose with Russia having a stop-loss program in place, then they don't have to worry about people resigning. But the biggest question I have is, will these be volunteers or volunteers? Because the Russian military already struggled to be an attractive recruiter. All the same problems that used to exist still exist. Fear over abuse or poor conditions, etc. in the military. But now added to that is the fact that the army is actively engaged in a war. There is a general awareness in Russian society that things are not going according to plan and that a lot of people have been killed or wounded. The MOD can announce whatever figures it likes, people talk. So one wonders if people are really going to be lining up to join the Russian army as volunteers by the hundreds of thousands, even though they already had an opportunity to join volunteer units in 2022 with much larger sign-on bonuses. So whether these troops will volunteer, be voluntold, or not eventuate at all, time will tell. So both armies are demonstrating an intention not just to replace losses from the winter, but also to build new units. Although, to be fair, the way they intend to go about it seems to differ significantly. Where does that leave us in terms of the challenges that they face and the impact on the war to come? On one hand, training capacity is likely a real and ongoing limitation for both sides. The massive infrastructure of the Soviet mobilization system doesn't exist anymore in Russia or Ukraine. Much of Russia's pre-war training capacity was usually tied up training the intakes of conscripts that come through the military twice per year, while Ukraine's training facilities will always be vulnerable to long-range missile attack. The limited number of instructors and training grounds is probably going to impose more of a hard limit on both sides than the number of potential recruits. Ukraine will no doubt benefit greatly from the training programs run by the EU, the UK, the United States and others. But those are only intended to furnish very approximately 60,000 recruits over the course of 2023. So building up Ukraine's own domestic training infrastructure is going to be vital. Meanwhile, on Russia's side, these sort of logistical limitations are a reason beyond the merely political why you're unlikely to see any mass general mobilization. I've seen reports fearfully claiming that Russia might suddenly decide to put millions of men and women into uniform to overwhelm Ukraine. My question would be, where would they be trained, who would train them, and with what equipment would they be armed? Because it takes at least some training and equipment to turn a recruit into a potentially effective soldier. If they can't communicate, can't entrench, can't maintain and fire a weapon, 
then they're probably not worth the logistical effort required to support them at the front line. Shortages in particularly high-skilled roles are also a problem all of their own. That's something that's probably going to require some creative solutions, and it's something I'll touch on in my video on the Ukrainian air war relatively soon. But the grimmer point comes in relation to that third question I raised earlier, not how quickly individuals could be mobilised or trained or equipped, but rather how many potential recruits were available on both sides. And the reason I bring this up is because coverage often focuses on the discrepancy in population and the demographic weaknesses of both Ukraine and Russia. The idea is, therefore, that Russia has the larger population, and therefore, in a war of attrition, it's going to be Ukraine that runs out of potential recruits first. Russia, as they say, simply has more blood to spare. But as cruel as it sounds, the question I have to raise from a historical perspective is how long do you expect that to take? Because history demonstrates that sufficiently motivated nations can take very, very large numbers of casualties before they're rendered unable as opposed to merely unwilling to fight on. The French military in World War I took 1.4 million military KIA, and it won. Soviet casualties in World War II, civilian and military, sailed far north of 20 million dead, against a population pre-war of approximately 170 million. And while it was traumatic, they won. I'm not saying I predict this conflict will continue until millions of military personnel have been killed. I'm simply pointing out that with the current casualty rates, neither side is going to mathematically run out of potential recruits potentially for decades. So it seems unlikely that recruitable population will be the factor that determines who endures longer. More important are likely to be factors like the will to mobilise the population that are there and the resources necessary to train and equip them. Russia has a larger recruitable pool, but so far it's been much less successful in attracting volunteers and also much more careful about imposing mobilisation. Shoigu's 400,000 volunteer recruits sounds a lot like Kitchener's new army. But this time around, there are no mile-long queues leading to the recruitment offices. Recruitable manpower is only the critical limit if it's the thing you run out of first. Which is why in so many of my videos I go into all of the inputs that go into creating a military capable of fighting a war. Sustaining a conflict requires manpower and the ability to train that manpower, but also requires equipment and readiness. It requires munitions and consumables. It requires the political and social will to go on, and the financial and economic stability to fund the whole thing. If any of those things are missing, then the war is over. If you have a million recruits but no guns, then a shovel charge is not going to take you to Kyiv. If you have a thousand artillery pieces but no rounds to fire, then they're just scrap metal. And looking at the results of the winter campaign, I suggest that the pain points on both sides, the things that really impede their ability to carry on military action through the spring and the summer, are more closely tied to equipment attrition and munition supply than the supply of new recruits. And so I want to focus the second half of this presentation on attrition not as it relates to human casualties, but instead to materiel. To say that equipment loss figures in Ukraine are highly contested would be a dramatic understatement. Both Russia and Ukraine's ministries of defence put out their own estimate for enemy equipment destruction. Both are pretty opaque about how they calculate their particular estimates. Asking around, for example, many told me they thought that Ukraine's estimates were simply a result of all of the reports from various units engaged in frontline contact, reporting their estimates up the chain and those being aggregated. But that belief certainly doesn't create certainty. And the Russian estimates often look like they were pulled directly from some parallel pocket dimension, in which Russia was fighting a successful conventional war against NATO and were halfway towards Berlin. And while these statistics seem to describe completely different wars, I think it's likely they both have one thing in common. If historical standards are anything to go by, they're probably both too high. The reasons for overclaiming are many and varied, and the way those factors interact depends a lot on the context of the conflict in question. But the reality is almost always when we test historical statistics, we find the same thing. Just like a bloke on his Tinder profile who rounds up his height from 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, or a dishonest golfer who just shaves a couple of strokes off when he hands his book in at the end of the day, military statistics have often had a way of making reality sound a lot better than it actually was. Now, World War II air combat is often used as a good example of this for a couple of reasons. On one hand, it's because air combat naturally lends itself to overclaiming. Multiple pilots can be shooting at the same enemy aircraft, meaning if it goes down, all of them can think they're the ones who are responsible for shooting it down. An aircraft can start smoking, meaning people assume it's destroyed, when in reality it makes its way all the way back to base. 
A modern equivalent would be firing a surface-to-air missile at an enemy aircraft, and then when it disappears off radar, assuming it's because you hit it and destroyed it, as opposed to, you know, because it broke radar contact. But the other reason air combat is good to look at is because for historians after the fact, it's much easier to check these claims against records kept by the other side than for things like land combat. During the Continuation War, there was an incident in which the Soviet Air Force claimed seven Finnish Brewster Buffaloes. The number shot down in reality was zero. In Burma, there was an engagement where the Japanese claimed six destroyed British Hurricanes, correct number zero. And just to take it to its logical extreme, an engagement between the RAF and the Imperial Japanese Navy where both sides claimed three opposing aircraft shot down and the actual number, as far as we can tell from records, is zero v zero. Now that's not particularly unusual. It's just the reality of people being people and war being war. But if you take those natural pressures towards overclaiming and you apply, for example, a culture of systemic lying in order to make oneself look better, a phenomenon that I've talked about in the context of the Russian army before, and you can see theoretically how overclaiming might become a serious issue. And to illustrate this for a moment, let's have a look at the official Russian MOD estimates of destroyed Ukrainian equipment. I don't want to spend too long on them because they're kind of a soft target, but at the same time, they're very frequently used. The Russian official estimates of destroyed Ukrainian materiel are fanciful. At 404 Ukrainian aircraft destroyed, the Russians have destroyed the entire pre-war Ukrainian air force more than once, and then they've overachieved by also shooting down all of the aircraft pledged to Ukraine, but which haven't yet arrived again more than once. All of Ukraine's MLRS systems, including those that have been resupplied by the West, have been destroyed more than once. All of Ukraine's HIMARS systems supplied to it by the United States have been destroyed, some of them more than once. And those HIMARS systems are being kept company in the equipment afterlife by all of the M777 artillery pieces that the Allies have supplied. Now, these claims put out by General Konoshenkov and the Russian Ministry of Defense have on occasion been openly mocked by channels linked to, for example, the Wagner Group. I've used this message as an example before, but it is hilarious and the sarcasm is real. In short, the numbers are not just likely highly inflated, they're literally impossible. Which is a win for the historical pattern of militaries overclaiming, but not particularly helpful if we're interested in a realistic estimate. A much more conservative source of estimates, for example, might be a visually confirmed loss database, with Oryx being perhaps the most famous. These are open source databases that only list a loss against Russia or Ukraine if there is video or visual evidence confirming the vehicle has been lost. Now, obviously, there's no reason to believe that these sort of sources are entirely accurate. There are factors explaining why they might be too high and factors speaking to why they might be too low. On one hand, you might have duplicated or falsified entries where the same piece of equipment is photographed from two different angles and counted twice. Now, that's something the team at Oryx tries to police quite actively, but despite that, mistakes can still be made. On the other side, there's plenty of reasons to think the data might undercount the actual losses. For one thing, it relies on someone taking a photo or a video of the destroyed piece of equipment and submitting it. That seems highly unrealistic. Not everyone is wearing a GoPro, and there's an awful lot of artillery flying around. On balance, I think there are more reasons to think the data undercounts losses than overcounts them. Duplication is probably less of an issue than equipment simply going unreported in the first instance. And so I generally look at something like the Oryx database as a soft floor on the total amount of losses. We can have some degree of confidence that at least that number of vehicles have been destroyed, captured or damaged. So what does that data show us? Firstly, it provides a sort of floor to likely equipment losses for both Russia and Ukraine. As at time of recording, that's 9,798 pieces of equipment for Russia versus 3,131 for Ukraine. It also allows us to check the official claims being made by both sides against what we can visually verify. In some categories, the differences are quite wide, particularly in aircraft, but in others, the official figures get a little closer. For example, for every 2.7 MLRS systems that Ukraine claims to have destroyed, we have visual evidence for one of them. If you're interested, the equivalent figure for Russian MOD claims is 27 to 1. So for every system Russia claims to have destroyed, we have evidence of 1. For tank destructions, the Ukrainian figure is a little bit under two times the visually confirmed figure. And as you'd expect, in every case, the visually confirmed figure is less than the equivalent MOD figure. The graphs on the right also show the impact of the winter offensive. You can see that the Russian loss figures were basically flattening out towards January, and then they started to increase significantly, taking on a curve that was less aggressive than during, for example, Kharkiv and Kherson, 
but which was more rapid than during comparative lulls in the fighting, or during previous periods where Russia has held the initiative like the middle of last year. So looking at those figures would seem to suggest that Russia's rate of equipment loss roughly doubled once they commenced their winter offensive, and that the identified ratio between Ukrainian and Russian losses is very roughly 3 to 1. And that's where a lot of analysis will stop. Indeed, the next step is usually to take these losses, compare them to estimated new production, repairs, or foreign resupply, to determine whether either side is capable of making up the losses that they're suffering. But the reality is a lot of equipment isn't destroyed or damaged in combat. Not every armoured vehicle manufactured will meet its destiny at the hands of an enemy anti-tank weapon. Some equipment doesn't die, it just fades away. Which brings me to the other side of the attrition equation and what civilians might think of as depreciation or consumption. And basically what I'm saying here is that things don't just get destroyed by the enemy, sometimes shit just breaks down or gets used up. Now obviously there can be some blurring between a combat loss and a non-combat loss in this respect. For example, if a vehicle breaks down near the front lines, is later captured by the Ukrainians and photographed, then that looks like a combat-related capture, even though really the vehicle was originally lost for non-combat reasons, perhaps the engine giving up. But the general point here is that equipment can be written off without ever being exposed necessarily to enemy fire. And while a Ukrainian drone might be likely to film a Ukrainian artillery strike on a tank, for example, it's less likely to be there filming if a tank breaks down outside of Belgorod and has to be transported to a repair facility for a complete overhaul. But just because it isn't filmed doesn't mean it isn't a major driving factor for equipment depreciation. To take just one random statistic to illustrate the point, in just one exercise in 1991, before it went into Desert Storm, the 24th Infantry Division lost 16 Abrams engines. And it wasn't because there were Iraqi saboteurs sneaking into the motor pool. It's just that driving tanks around in super sandy conditions can do bad things to the engine if you're not particularly careful. Readiness is a challenge for militaries around the world in part because it's hard to be ready for a mission without giving your people a chance to practice using their equipment. And it's very hard to give people a chance to practice using their equipment without risking them breaking it, which in turn is very expensive. And in a military context, just about everything when it comes down to it is a consumable. Nothing lasts forever, everything has a lifespan. Artillery barrels have a lifespan. After a certain number of rounds, it doesn't matter if an artillery piece hasn't been destroyed by the enemy, it's going to have to be rebarreled, or it's going to become first inaccurate and then eventually completely unsafe. Engines too have a total service life, as well as overhaul windows along the way. And so too does just about everything else from ammunition to airframes. Even human beings, to an extent, have a combat lifespan. Some combat experience historically helps harden units up, it gives troops experience, it makes them better at what they do as a general rule. But eventually people, just like equipment, burn out. Too much stress, too much exertion, too much constant danger, and eventually veteran troops can start to break down. It happens at different rates and in different ways to different people, but the phenomenon is real. Going back to equipment, this is one of the reasons why exercises and training can be so expensive. Ask a child what they think an Air Force pilot does every day, and their answer will probably be something naive like, you know, fly airplanes. And sure, there'd probably be some training benefit for letting pilots fly hundreds of hours per year in their primary aircraft doing large-scale red-on-blue exercises. I'm sure there aren't many artillery crews out there that would say no to a chance to practice with, say, hundreds of rounds of live ammunition every year. But the reality is that would run even the most well-funded militaries in the world out of money pretty damn quickly. Giving a Raptor pilot 10 extra flying hours per year is probably going to cost more than their salary. Burning out artillery barrels and ammunition stockpiles might be appreciated by the artillery gunners themselves, but not by the pencil pushers trying to balance the budget. If you want to keep equipment depreciation and attrition low, then the safest place for it is parked in a hangar or the motor pool. And the worst thing you could possibly do is try and fight a full-scale war. Because in a war, you tend to use a lot of stuff rather than leaving it parked around doing nothing. From a military perspective, this makes a great deal of sense. Tanks are more useful if they are fighting the enemy than if they are sitting around doing nothing. But using equipment at scale drives the consumption of that very equipment. And this is part of the reason I continue to be confused by pro-Russian commentators bragging about how many artillery rounds they fire or how many vehicles they have deployed. 
because the more force that you're deploying, the more realistically you need to accomplish in order to make that force employment worth it. If I'm using four times as many tanks, firing three or four times as many artillery shells, or flying ten times as many air sorties, then in a nutritional sense, all else being equal, I'm losing more than my opponent. I'm burning more barrels, more engines, more platforms, more resources than my opponent is. So I better be achieving more. Throwing four times as many resources at the problem and then not taking Bakhmut is not something you brag over. Instead, it would be much more impressive if it was the other way around, if Russia was managing to make advances or hold things steady despite using considerably less resources than the Ukrainians were. Because at scale, the costs can add up pretty quickly. To take one example, if you look at the Rusi report on the air war in Ukraine, and I want to look at the air war in Ukraine in the next couple of weeks. They report that one tactic the Russian Air Force is using is putting up combat air patrols, or CAPs. Basically, they've divided Ukraine up into eight different zones, and inside each zone, at any given time, there's going to be a pair of Sukhoi 35S or MiG 31BM interceptors carrying long range missiles, and if they identify a Ukrainian air target, they're going to lob like an R 37 missile at it. So, eight zones, two aircraft per zone, and you're assuming coverage during all of the daylight hours. That means before you count reconnaissance, ground attack, any other sort of mission type, you've got 70,000 flight hours per annum accounted for. 96 sorties a day, approximately two hours each. The full service life of a MiG-31 airframe after it has gone through its SLEP, its service life extension program, is 3,500 hours. Meaning that if all those sorties were being flown by MiG-31s, the fleet would accumulate enough flying hours over the course of the year just flying that one mission type to write off 20 airframes. Now, obviously, those hours would be spread over multiple airframes, so you wouldn't just lose 20 aircraft and the rest would be fine, but that raises its own problems that we'll look at in a minute. To give an example of how expensive large-scale military operations can be, the costs of Desert Storm in 1991, depending on how you choose to calculate the cost, I'll attach some relevant documents, was somewhere between 60 and more than 100 billion US dollars in 1991 terms. In 2023, that would be somewhere between 130 and 220 billion. In other words, the cost of Desert Storm, the deployment pay, the logistics, the added maintenance and all the associated costs, fuel consumption, ammo consumption, etc., was more than the entire annual Russian military budget. And Desert Storm itself lasted less than two months. Now, where this can get really ugly is if a force is using a lot of equipment that is near the end of its service life already when a conflict breaks out. Say, for example, if you were using a whole bunch of equipment that was manufactured in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, or the 90s. A lot of what is being used in Ukraine by both the Russians and the Ukrainians is quite old. Soviet equipment is often described as being quite hardy, but that's in the context of being easy to repair. It doesn't mean they don't break down an awful lot. And if you're using a whole bunch of equipment that is relatively close to the end of its planned service life or that has had maintenance deferred, you're not starting the clock at zero once you send them into combat, you're starting it from dangerously close to the end of the line. If you consider the MiG-31 fleet again that we just talked about, the last of those were manufactured I think in 1994 with the last ones going to Kazakhstan, not the Russian Air Force. They had announced a service life extension program from 2,500 hours for the airframe to 3,500. And they'd done it because a lot of the fleet was starting to push it in terms of service lifespan. Now, if hypothetically the MiG-31 fleet was at 2,500 hours with only 1,000 on the clock as opposed to starting at zero, then flying a year of combat air patrol wouldn't burn out 20 airframes, it would burn out 70, which is a majority of the active fleet. Pulling ancient guns and tanks out of storage sounds like a reasonable and practical idea. But I have to ask the question, how many hours are left on those engines? How many rounds went through those barrels before the vehicles were stored? How much has corroded or worn down while it's in storage? And what's the spare parts pipeline for equipment that's been out of service for decades? A lot of these vehicles are going to be fixer-uppers. That rusty T-62 from a storage field in Siberia is going to need some TLC before it can go into battle in Ukraine. But the problem then becomes... Who does that necessary maintenance work and what factories produce the spare parts? Because again, Western militaries often face readiness issues even during peacetime. Spare part orders are often backlogged. And readiness issues in, for example, the Bundeswehr are just, well, famous. But the Russians too have to obey the laws of physics. 
The defence industry is only so big, there are only so many experts available. And as this war goes on, they're likely going to be asked to do everything at once. For example, just think about Rovagon Zavod, the tank manufacturer. You're the boss of this particular firm and you hear that Russia has gone to war. Okay, not great, but it might be beneficial for business, let's handle it as best we can. So Official 1 walks in with a list of instructions basically saying that you need to increase the production of new armoured vehicles, in particular T-90M. Now before the war you might only have been producing about 240 new tank hulls per year, you've got to lift those numbers, so okay, you'll add additional shifts, find additional labour where you can, clear some room on the floor, maybe you can make it work. But then official number two comes in and says that there are hundreds of tanks in storage that need to be restored. Some of them need to be overhauled, all of them need to be modernised, fitted with thermal optics and explosive reactive armour before they can be sent into combat and it needs to happen by the hundreds. And you nervously say okay because you have no other choice but you're not sure who you're going to put on the job because all of your employees are already going to be more than busy trying to ramp up existing vehicle production. As you're sitting down fretting, an email arrives telling you that you're going to need to massively increase your production of spare parts to sustain the vehicles that are already in the field. Also, your technicians are going to need to provide support for life extension and overhaul work. But you can't think of how you're going to do it because any increased spare parts production is going to go as an input to repairing, modernising or producing new vehicles. Finally, as you're thinking about how to do the impossible, someone nervously walks in and drops a folder on your desk. In it, there are images of field after field of tanks that have been damaged during the so-called special military operation in Ukraine. They, he says, need to be repaired, and your company is the one to do it. And it's probably at that point that you collect some glasses and a bottle of vodka from a cabinet in your desk and ask yourself how it all came to this. If you want some evidence of how much of this repair and overhaul work has to be done, well, here are a couple of data points. Repairs can be done, we've discussed this with the chief before, at multiple levels. The unit can repair simple things themselves. Then in Ukraine, there's also maintenance that's done by the manufacturer close to the front and stuff that requires it to be carted back to a factory, potentially overseas. The big Ukrainian arms enterprise reported that between the 24th of February and the 22nd of March, 2022 to 2023, it repaired 3,000 armoured vehicles in combat areas, with some armoured vehicles being repaired more than once. That's more than an order of magnitude greater than the visually confirmed damage numbers recorded by Oryx. A further 155 to 309 were repaired in rear areas. We know that repair and overhaul activity is being done in Poland, in Lithuania, in Slovakia, in Bulgaria and a number of other countries. And while some of these repairs will relate to undoing the results of enemy action, a lot of it is just going to be stuff that broke and needed to be fixed. Another piece of evidence that Russian defence industry is stretched keeping up with all these demands comes from some Indian sources. In particular, some recent testimony to the Standing Committee on Defence, which I'll attach in the description. In essence, some spending categories are projected to come in under the original projection. They're not going to be able to buy as much stuff as they originally budgeted for. And that's because, according to the testimony, a number of deliveries that India was meant to take from Russia are not taking place. I suggest if the Russian armaments industry isn't able to make its obligations to its international customers, then it's likely because it's already working to or beyond capacity just meeting Russia's own requirements. Not just to replace combat losses, but also to sustain the enormous mechanised force that's now being deployed. Russia does have huge stocks of old equipment, but the more it deploys and the older and more decrepit it gets, then the greater the readiness challenges are likely to become and the greater the strain on the defence industrial base and the associated workforce. And that industrial limitation runs headfirst into the challenges involved in equipping and sustaining new Russian units. The story of how Russia has tried to equip all of these new recruits and make up for losses suffered in Ukraine is something we've covered before. There's two primary pipelines for equipment. There's brand new equipment, usually produced to a reasonable standard that's delivered as new and the much larger share of the pipeline, which is older equipment reactivated from storage. One thing we've seen play out in the lost data in Ukraine is that over time, the density of older systems that are identified as being destroyed has increased. Older systems that weren't even in service at the beginning of the war, like the T-62, now regularly feature in the visually confirmed loss list. And I suggest it's reasonable that that trend will continue. Some units will receive small quantities of very new equipment, while others have to deal with older and older stuff dragged out of the boneyard. But before I leave it at that, I really have to quickly talk about the T-54 thing. 
For those of you who didn't see, recently video came out from the conflict intelligence team showing that Russia was shipping T-54 tanks, so tanks designed in the 1940s which entered service under Stalin from storage facilities in the east to the west. There were some arguments over whether this was legitimate or not, and then the vehicles were mentioned on Russian state TV. The commentators there, of course, took the view that there is absolutely nothing wrong with pulling 70-year-old vehicles out of storage, and that indeed, if necessary, Russia could probably create new tank units using T-34s on World War II monuments. Because nothing says all according to plan like ripping vehicles out of museums. Now, on one hand, people have a tendency to point and laugh. I've seen a lot of headings on YouTube basically saying, hey, the fact the Russians are pulling out vehicles this old means that they're literally out of everything else. I do not believe that that is a good assumption to make. In fact, I think it's actively a bad one. There are plenty of reasons that Russia might be wheeling these fossils out. Some have already been mentioned elsewhere. On one hand, it fires 100mm ammo. Russia may still have stockpiles of that, and critically, some of Russia's allies will have stockpiles as well. It's still a tank, it's still got some armour on it, so even if it's not suitable for going toe-to-toe -to -toe with leopards, and even if it's vulnerable to literally every anti-tank weapon in service in Ukraine, maybe this thing would still do reasonable service as an assault gun or as a self-propelled artillery piece. But I think one of the most important reasons we might be seeing them is because potentially some of them are already running. I strongly suspect Russian industry is going to face bottlenecks. It needs to produce new vehicles, it needs to restore vehicles in deep storage, it needs to repair vehicles damaged at the front. So there may well still be T-72s or newer vehicles in Russian tank storage, but they might require refurbishment first. If these T-55s are already functional and suitable for use in the here and now, then maybe you use them until industrial capacity frees up to reactivate something better. At the end of the day, it's a gun with an engine, so I imagine someone will find use for it somewhere. More concerning for me than T-54s and 55s coming out of storage is the apparent massive disconnect between the official Russian military budget and the sheer amount of work they are going to need to meet production, sustainment and repair targets, especially after the exertions and significant vehicle losses of the winter campaign. The Russian budget has to do a heck of a lot more heavy lifting than it did in 2021. You've got a massive increase in the number of personnel. They need to be paid. All troops involved in the special operation, as they call it, need combat pay and various allowances. You need to pay to increase the production rates of just about everything from armoured vehicles to ammunition. You need to fund the restoration of armaments from storage. You need to provide additional spare parts, fuel and other critical inputs. And you need to do all of it with only a marginal increase in defence spending in a high inflation highly sanctioned, labour-constrained market. If those numbers are accurate, then I predict that one of three things is going to happen. Either there is going to be a significant cost overrun and Russia is going to spend far more on national defence than it anticipates. The second option is there's a whole bunch of secret military spending that isn't in the official announcements, which is basically an overrun by another name. And the third option is that Russia simply under-delivers. They don't produce as many new vehicles, as much ammunition, or raise as many new personnel as is feared. The money and the capacity isn't there, and targets just aren't hit. Both scenarios would have benefits for the Ukrainians. A massive cost overrun would increase the burn rate of Russia's financial resources. While a failure to deliver, well, that would just reduce the combat potential of the Russian armed forces. And for Ukraine as well, equipment losses and industrial limitations are probably critical concerns. Despite the losses it suffered, Ukraine probably remains more constrained by the supply of heavy equipment, ammunition, and also its training pipeline than it does by the availability of recruits. Millions of potentially eligible Ukrainians have not yet been mobilised, but putting them into service makes little sense if there isn't the equipment or training capacity to convert them into combat troops. I've talked about the importance of Western resupply for Ukraine before, and the graph on the right shows that supply has continued to escalate. And in most categories, the amount of equipment supplied exceeds the visually confirmed losses for that vehicle type. But there are three key caveats that impact force generation. The first is we're only talking about visually confirmed losses, which are probably an underestimate. The second point is that just replacing losses isn't enough to meet Ukrainian requirements. The Ukrainian armed forces are much larger than they were at the start of the war which means if they're going to fight the way they understand how to fight, they're going to need more equipment to match those numbers. 
The final observation is that in some categories, support has just been inadequate even compared to visually confirmed losses. Here, infantry fighting vehicles stand out as a major area of need. The Ukrainians just need more of them, en masse. And at the moment, there are a lot of Ukrainian mechanised infantry formations that aren't nearly as mechanised as the name would suggest. The Ukrainians have often pushed things like MRAPs or M113s into service in place of infantry fighting vehicles. But if you're turning up to a fight, would you rather your fire support asset be a Humvee or a Bradley? A lot of Ukrainian force generation efforts have been enabled not just by Western supply, but also by equipment captured from the Russians. In some system categories, the amount of equipment taken from the Russians is on paper equivalent to the declared supply from Western countries. If you look at the fighting around places like Bakhmut, you've got testimony of units there fighting that are equipped entirely, for example, with T-80 tanks taken from First Guard's tank army. On one hand, this has been a massive advantage for Ukraine's ability to equip all of the troops that it is mobilising and to make up for its losses. But in the longer term, it's also a potential risk for certain systems. Some of the equipment being captured wasn't in Ukrainian service before it was taken, nor was it in service with any of the former Warsaw Pact states. There's no existing supply of spare parts, there's no existing know-how on maintenance and repair. Now, of course, the Ukrainian repair crews get on with the job as best they can. I've seen more than one anecdote of repair crews just hunting for a manual on the internet and taking it from there. But in the long run, some of this captured equipment is going to be particularly vulnerable to breakdown and attrition. And that would put further pressure on the Ukrainian military to either capture more equipment from the Russians, seek more deliveries from the West, or downscale their efforts to arm and equip units. Until then, Russia's contribution to Ukrainian force generation efforts remains one of the more interesting historical footnotes of the war so far. If you want to put some numbers around the change in Ukraine's equipment position over the course of the winter battles, this is probably a good start. What you see charted here is the net change in various equipment categories between losses as negatives and resupply pledged by Western countries as positives. That is, between the 5th of January and the 25th of March, the difference between visually confirmed losses and newly pledged tanks resupplied to Ukraine was positive 158, putting the Ukrainians on paper in a better position than when they started. But the caveats here are very real, with the two biggest ones being that these are visually confirmed losses only, and second and most importantly, that this is equipment pledged, not equipment delivered, and that much of the equipment represented by these orange bars may yet be months away. But the basic premise is that as long as deliveries continue to be pledged and then actually delivered, then it's possible for the Ukrainians to both sustain the fight and potentially build new units, overcoming losses and enabling further force generation. When it comes to projecting how long the Russians can continue, meanwhile, things become a little bit more difficult, because Russian arms manufacturers aren't exactly releasing reliable production data at the moment. So trying to figure out how long it will take for them to replace the vehicles lost, for example, at Vladar is a difficult exercise. From that industrial and equipment-centric perspective, there are a couple of estimates out there over how long Russia can keep this up. Lithuanian military intelligence, for example, estimated in early March that Russia could keep this up for about another two years. Other Western officials have talked about Russia facing severe constraints in certain categories by the end of 2023. For my part, I suspect that all of those estimates are really contingent. Contingent on how much money and manpower the Russians throw at the problem, contingent on support from Russia's friends and allies, and contingent on the casualties and damage that Russia suffers in Ukraine. In any case, Russia is unlikely to ever entirely run out of any of its critical inputs. There will always be some shells, there will always be some new or refurbished tanks. What will change is the quality and the scale of the force that it can afford to field. In conclusion, attrition and force generation efforts in Ukraine have often made more difference than the seizure of individual pieces of territory. Ukraine has often focused on inflicting attrition and generating new units as opposed to launching constant offensives, and only once conditions are favourable launching counter-offensives. It's generally agreed that the winter campaign just passed was relatively expensive for both sides, but particularly for the Russians. The data available is obviously highly variable, but most of what is available in open source that I've reviewed suggests that by fighting a primarily defensive winter campaign, Ukraine was able to achieve a positive exchange ratio against the Russian attackers, and notably one that hasn't prevented Ukraine from slowly forming up new brigades with new equipment for potential offensive actions.
casualties have likely been significant, leading to force quality issues on both sides. But to me, it seems like the generation efforts by both sides are still primarily gated by equipment, with Russia forced to use older and older materiel, while Ukraine's actions seem increasingly gated to the supply of Western armaments. What we will now see over the spring and summer is how effectively both sides are able to recover from the attrition that they've suffered, rebuild their offensive potential, and fight it out for the initiative during the campaigning season. Okay, only a brief channel update to close out because I'm aware this video is going out late. That's something I apologise for, but there were difficulties pulling this one together and I didn't want to rush things. What I really want to close with here is a reflection. I come at these topics with a certain background and way of thinking, that is, a very strategic top-level view of resources as inputs and outputs, which I know means I can talk about manpower in very cold and sterile terms. So I'd like to reflect one last time that every time I put a statistic up on a slide relating to casualties, those figures are not counting hunks of metal, they are counting people. People who have gone through the horrible experience of war, suffered for it, and who often leave grieving families behind. I'll always do my best to analyse this war in the clearest way I can. But as I thank you and promise to see you all again next week, I just thought it appropriate to end with that short reminder. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next Sunday.